So it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Keith Zelda. Dr. Zelda is a clinician and researcher in the disciplines of pediatric dentistry and dental public health. In addition to his role as assistant professor, Dr. De Silva is working on his PhD in public policy with a research focus on oral health policy and access to dental care. He completed his dental training at Columbia University College of Dental Medicine, his pediatric dentistry training at the New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. He has his master's in dental public health from the University of Toronto. He's also a fellow of the Royal College of Dentists of Canada in both pediatric dentistry and dental public health. After spending eight years in private practice, Dr. De Silva shifted his focus and is now primarily involved in teaching and research activities. He's also active with the dental community, including currently serving as the president of the Canadian Association of Public Health Dentistry. Welcome, Dr. De Silva. Ready? Sound way more accomplished on paper today. <laughs> it's almost a novelty uh, being here in person, standing in front of the podium again, but a welcoming experience to not be only as being talk about it being here. I think it's been this is my fifth year now with Saskatoon, and yeah, uh, you know, as a family unit, we, we love just living here within the town and set within the city. It's Really felt like all of it. I mean, really welcome here you know, by the community. So it's my pleasure to to be here today talking to the coalition on some of the work that we do at the CAP. And again, the topic that I want to talk to you is just about the federal dental plan because you know, it's been a very exciting time, I think, on the national stage, but, but also uh, a very anxious time for a lot of us with the lack of details. And uh, we all kind of have a lot through what this program could be. We're also very worried of what it could be um, based on our own experience. So it's you know part of an effort to buy a little bit of that extra context, uh, at least for what we've heard and uh, the discussions we've been a part of, and then trying to um, figure out where, what we need to do going forward um, as a collective. So to start, I just wanted to again acknowledge that that you know we're here on Treaty Six territory and uh, homeland of Métis, so it's like they by respects to the ancestors of this place and this land, this um, very old uh, snow-covered land. <laughs> but I'm um, always important for me to start off any talk just uh, positioning myself and uh, where I am um, where in terms of uh, you know kind of recommitting to reconciliation and the problems with whatever little part that I can do. So I also just want to make my kind of standard disclosure that I have no financial relationships or any conflict of interest. Uh, I'm not employed by Health Canada. If I was, I probably wouldn't be speaking here on this topic for you today. Uh, and also, generally speaking, um, I do wear many hats, um, including um, being part of the University of Saskatchewan, but my views down today represent those from the Canadian Association of Public Health and Industry. And so in terms of an outline, um, we'll go through a, a little bit of background um, just on that specific here, but I mean, the bulk of what we're going to talk about is first the development of the um, current Canada that's the benefit, because it's an interesting story now we've got to where we are today, these policy decisions don't happen overnight. Uh, we'll go through some of the more uh, details, at least what it's in terms of what we know uh, and what we don't know, uh, because there is some confusion about the plan itself. And then just mapping a path forward in terms of what we can do um, you know, within our respective organization or respective roles um, as members of the oral health community to what we need to be really looking out for. All right, so again, I'm here representing the Canadian Association of Public Health Dentistry, which a lot of you um, I know are members of and will have in the past. Uh, so we're all going to have a close to the community. Um, the organization really started out uh, as a small group of dental public health professionals, uh, but has now expanded to include the, the full complement of all of healthcare professionals. So our members, uh, including our board, consist of uh, not only dentists, but dental hygienists, dental therapists, dental assistants, um, as well as a lot of uh, non-recognized or non-licensed for health care professionals who have an interest in dental public health. So we, we often see ourselves as the mediator and in terms of some of the discussions on our health, because we do represent a, a large variety of different views. 
In, in terms of our Canadian model healthcare system, so that this should not come as any surprise to anyone. We live in a private world for the most part. And most of dental care in Canada is financed in private dollars. And that comes from either the private insurance or the employer based insurance or other pocket payments. Now, we do have a lot of public funded programs, but they represent a very small portion of the overall funding for dental care. Likewise, um, most of the service transactions or the delivery of care happens in private clinics, so the traditional dental office, which is now becoming almost the traditional corporate dental office um, with multiple chains um, being shipped at other places to be going in Canada. Um, but we also do have care to hospital clinics, community based clinics, uh, school based clinics. You know, Saskatchewan still historically has one of the best models in the old. And special tensile plan that it is still studied worldwide as one of the ideals to, to strive for. Um, but again, it's still the majority being delivered in the private system. Second, I think. Um, but in terms of the financing and private dollars, so in 2019 is probably the last year we have accurate data from kind of pre pandemic. So roughly 17 billion. Uh, spent on the whole here. Uh, for comparison, uh, healthcare in total is closer to 400 billion. So we're, we're still a small portion of that, but that uh, said, we still so significant. But the majority of payments we see in the um, sort of private insurance. So again, either private plans or employer based or uh, employer sponsored plans, out of pocket payments. So those were not insured, and uh, 32%. And that tiny sliver of 6% uh, is where funding for public sources, so provincial and federal programs. Interestingly, um, almost three fifths of the um, public expenditures come from the federal government. So, through the NIHB program or other um, federal related programs. So, provincial, officially funded programs actually represents a very, very small public dollars. Yeah, this is the uh, figure showing just trends over the last 50 years in spending for dental care, just to kind of illustrate points. Um, so this is adjusted for cost of dollars, um, so inflation has been uh, equilibrated here. Uh, so the, the green line at the top bar shows the total uh, trends in spending. So you can see a general increase um, over time. So dental fees are, are going up and we're spending more on dental care. The orange line represents the private um, sources for funding. So you can see there is almost exactly. Some of the little dips in the line just represent the periods of recession. So you know, if you look, there's one of the 80s, um, a smaller blip. Um, the 2008 recession tends to be where um, that bigger dip towards the end is. And we're now seeing you know, a major pet increase you know, based on the pandemic. The blue line at the bottom, which you almost miss, uh, is the public public. So over time, that really hasn't changed. And while dental fees have um, come up, so it just highlights um, the increase in cost of dental care compared to um, what governments are typically paying to to make up that gap or lack of right. How does this compare generally to to healthcare? And um, so you know, the last twenty years hasn't been much change in the proportions. So roughly seventy percent of all healthcare expenditures. So that's and hospital care, physicians care, pharmaceutical, and 70% comes from public sources, 30%, uh, the bulk of which is um, pharmaceutical um, care, comes from private sources. So, you know, 6% of public funding for dental care compared to 70% for investment health care. And, and that kind of drastic comparison really sums up um, kind of the problems and equity and access that we have um, related to dental care. Thing. So, you know, it, it should come as no surprise that yeah, cost is one of the biggest barriers to, to dental care. So, also one in five Canadians report um, cost is a barrier. Um, but if you compare it to, to other services, so um, the red bars are showing responses for low income adults compared to the grade bar, which are high income adults. So, you know, skipping dental care on this 40% of the low income adults, and the point that they've had to skip dental care and cost. Compared to 17 percent of high income and individuals, but if you compare it to skipping a medical test or having a medical problem in the visit a doctor or filling a prescription, you can see that the magnitude of this is quite starkly different um, for the dental care. Although I, I do expect to see um, the medical tests or the medical problems that gap increasing over the next five years, just because of how stretched our 
that healthcare system is and the lack of that nurses and family physicians. So we can see that here in the past few minutes, more we'll pronounced throughout the province, but uh, as we kind of recover from the pandemic, our healthcare system is quite strained. Uh, but again, you know, we tend to focus on cost, uh, but, but it's only one of the few, you know, our many barriers to accessing care. Um, and, and so we do need to consider you know, geographic locations or in our less accessible area. Uh, you know, it's a challenge to, to, uh, to find any kind of help with the provider. Human resources, we talk about the distribution of all health care professionals, where they are, and um, they tend to be um, concentrated in cities. Um, but also other barriers such as health barriers, cultural barriers, um, and as well as we're learning a lot more our network uh, about cultural safety uh, in terms of just the atmosphere that we create as uh, all the healthcare providers and um, the lack of trust that particularly Indigenous populations have with the healthcare system in general and working towards creating a more um, wholesome relationship with um, the patients who we are working with. So all considered barriers. But generally speaking, yeah. we, we tend to focus on the cost aspect of it. So these are some kind of, um, we'll say advocacy type advertisements by professional mental associations. So the first one is from the Ontario Medical Association, uh, where I'm originally from, and this type of ad featured very heavily, uh, kind of in the lead up to the 2016 provincial election as well as subsequent elections. So it was the Ontario Dental Association asking the provincial government to uh, increase funding for um, their provincial program, the Healthy Smiles program, with which you can kind of read between the lines. Uh, you know, it was asking for high reimbursement rates. Um, which, which was needed. I think Ontario had the lowest portion of these uh, compared to the final fee value. But it's also a bit self serving uh, when you're trying to promote access to care and only focused on the first the rate. So you have to call things out as they are. Uh, but generally, advocacy up until that point focused on provincial programs and provincial governments. It wasn't until about 2019 when the NPP first kind of introduced dental care as part of. An actual federal platform. Up until that point, it was almost been heard of having to be on a national level. But they included as part of the platform. And we started to see more attention to federal programs and the federal government in terms of advocacy. And so uh, the picture on the far side of the street is from the you know, Health Care Alliance of Ontario. Again, making a call um, to the federal government to increase in investing in. Um, just oral health care in general, without necessarily making a specific plan, but you know, increasing the commitment uh, from a federal level. And you know, typically, uh, oral health care has always been in the provincial domain, so it was um, seen as a bit of a stretch at the time to, to make that ask, but one that, um, you know, with some persistence, has started to see some activity. At, at the CAPHP, you know, we did take that opportunity in 2019 and we're uh, Invited to make a submission to the House of Commons Health Care Committee. Standing Committee on Health that was tasked with looking at dental care. Uh, and so we provided them with a document, um, not outlining you know, what an idea of plan could be, because really there was no consensus on what um, that could look like. Um, but what we were trying to do is provide different policy options on. Um, how they could be more involved. So it included things like you know, increasing uh, funding. So if they just wanted to the transfer funds or develop their own program, or there needed to be a financial commitment. We were looking for um, policy advice from the federal government for provinces. So um, you know, if you look even here at Saskatchewan, there are several different programs providing well health care um, services, um, whether it's through social assistance or through um, health care type plans. Uh, but the idea was trying to create a universal standard that all provinces can use to kind of like really combine different um, programs together, as well as you know trying to make a commitment from providing guidance on the public delivery, looking at examples of where that works, um, and, and an evidence-based kind of approach to it. Um, so our focus was really development evidence-based basket of services 
you know, things that should be that included in the Delta plan, many of which are, are not in those public programs. Around the same time, what was um, kind of going on in Canada? So, um, you, know, you need a little bit of a spark plug in terms of making any gains uh, in terms of uh, policy work. And, and so, you know, that did come from the NDP government um, with an NDP letter that Don Davies is something they really with, but he's really been uh, kind of tried to enforce within Parliament. And, and so, in October of 2020, uh, he had asked for the uh, Parliament and Budget Office to cost out the dental plan. So what would a universal plan in Canada for the federal level look like? Um, you know, this was heavily informed by members of the dental public health community. So the former chief dental officer of Canada, Dr. Peter Lee, as well as Dr. Carlos Quinones, um, the names who some of you might recognize, um, their hands were all over this report. But essentially, they were looking at um, what was going to cost the government, because when you're talking about the policy, um, the cost is always um, you know, the first item uh, that they discuss. What could it look like? Who could it cover? What like the details um, kind of uh, be involved with that? And, and so, you know, without going into the details of the report, there are three things that I've pulled out. Um, but really looking at um, you know, who the target population was going to be. And so they were including a pretty comprehensive list. So you know, low income they defined as anyone under or any family of 90,000. So that number should look familiar to you at this point. Um, they're expecting a reach of uh, 6.5 million Canadians who would be eligible. And they initially costed out so 1.5 billion per year uh, up until 2025 with an initial cost of 3 million. And that initial cost um, related to two factors. So one was just the infrastructure needed but also they figured in the first year you know, there would likely be uh, a big wave of people trying to get access to catch up for uh, managers about having that service. So this was kind of the blueprint um, of where some of these things come. Uh, they did make some assumptions and it's kind of important to go through this because again, some of these numbers might be familiar to you. Um, so one, you know, they, they based their estimates on the NHP program um, you know, the program itself has many challenges. Um, it by no means a perfect program. Uh, but in terms of costing, it can be reimbursable rates. It's one of the better ones uh, compared to other NHP programs. So that was kind of the standard in terms of the services included and the, uh, the fees involved. Uh, you know, they uh, model based on no co or cost sharing for individuals under 7,000. So that should be a start looking familiar. Uh, would be co-payment between 70 and 90,000. Um, inflation was uh, included uh, in the model. And, and also this last one, um, which turns out it could be a very big assumption, but that existing provincial uh, and territorial dental programs would remain you know, throughout the duration of the spending. And that's going to be up for debate, I think, going forward. Interestingly, um, something that we often don't talk about or has gone under the radar what I suppose how things we've gone. Yeah. So in the spring of 2021 um, in their election, Liberal governments, um, one of my party um, companies, um, shortly thereafter, uh, they had a confidence and supply agreement uh, with the Yukon NDP office. Um, so yeah, basically the confidence and supply agreement is with a minority government, um, you're trying to pass your budget, but if you don't get enough votes, uh, you know, another election is uh, triggered. So you need some votes from the um, other minority parties uh, to help pop up the government. So a confidence supply agreement basically saying that one party will not vote against, uh, they'll have enough votes to pass their budget in exchange for this list of deliverables or these services. And um, it's an essential kind of uh, issue when you have uh, not enough votes in the no party to keep your government on board. So part of uh, this confidence is working for five um, So you know, this is essentially a platform to a certain degree um, by making democracy work for people, address climate change, creating jobs, building a sustainable common food services, and making life more affordable. So kind of the essential um, components that the NEP were looking for What's relevant to us was the W4 improvement service people count on. So part of that was a commitment to a territorial wide universal dental care plan. 
to happen. It was originally supposed to be launched this past spring, but with the announcement of the federal plan, they took a pause. Uh, they expect that to be rolled out in uh, December. And so, in universe, also, um, any member of the youth plan not covered by an existing provincial or federal plan would be eligible um, for it. So, it, it really is one of the um, few examples of the universal plan in Canada, but also um, the blueprint for what the NDP was doing at the federal level. So um, it was all there right in front of us. We just didn't see it and uh, realize that it could happen. So fast forward a few months, we had a federal election shortly thereafter the fall of 2021. And um, as we had expected, that blueprint was there for the plan itself uh, through the Parliament Budget Office, the details as well as now a conference is agreement. So this is exactly what the federal did in uh, exchange for um, four years essentially of not contesting the liberal governments. Um, it was an exchange for these components. And so and some of these will look familiar. I won't read through them all, but it's uh, a better healthcare system, making life more affordable, making democracy work. But these are line for line for being the ground and that blueprint and and so again at the time it was March 22nd when the first iteration of the details were given to us, and really this is all we had to go on. It was um, just a few bullet points, but that was as much information as we all had at the time. And so it was a new dental care program intended for local Canadians. Again, these numbers um, should now be familiar. So we have less, uh, less than 90,000, with no co fees, running around 70,000. Now it's going to be rolled out in stages. So under the age of 12, uh, the idea was to have that in place by something in place by December. That by 2023, this would expand to children under 18, individuals with disabilities and seniors, and then by 2025, full implementation. At the time, we didn't know what full implementation was going to be, whether that would be low income adults or other populations, but the intent was that it would. But this is really all that we had to go by, and of course, a lot of confusion, a lot of anxiety, but a lot of optimism as well. So the timeline was kind of set by the NDP. So essentially, this was the annual scale in March of 2022, with the idea that by December 1st, um, something had to be rolled out. You know, for anyone who's involved with you know, program management, and you know what a monumental task that is to get all the things in place. So it's giving the scope of what was involved and then and complicated mechanisms of what we have to do. In place by the time. So, I, the first thing I saw when um, I did out of the list, and yeah, this is great, but good luck um, until the next few months. Now, we, we were fortunate that um, the federal government um, didn't decide to necessarily go out on their own on this at that time. So, they did have a very wide ranging round of consultations. Some of you have been a part of this at um, various times. But it include meeting with um, a lot of the, most of the National Medical Association, so the Canadian Medical Association, as an IG Medical Association, that will bear the um, we were involved as a stakeholder. Then expand into the provincial medical associations, and the medical regulatory authorities, provincial governments uh, were involved there because they had a role to play with it, academic institutions, insurance providers. And this is just a list about. People who I saw um, in different roundtable discussions, but I'm sure there was more. You know, perhaps um, you may have been solving a bit too much at times as the thought was taking place. Um, what was that at a moment? Sorry. And so, again, it started in March. I think their first roundtable discussions with members of the community started as soon as April, and it continued throughout the summer months. In, in terms of uh, at least what I heard in the meetings I attended, so this is kind of a, a list of different requests and um, perceived needs of the different stakeholder groups. Um, some are definitely conflicting with each other, but so I'll, I'll just kind of read them out because it sums up the discussions that were being had at this time. So, you know, there are groups who, who were added that it should be federally administered the program uh, just because of their experience with some provincial programs. Um, there were others who, you know, insisted that the funds be transferred to the provinces and you know, for the existing provincial programs. Um, increased universal rates. Uh, I think you can kind of guess who was asking for that, um, but it was um, a common discussion point. 
increased the need for public delivery. There's a lot of examples, particularly in Oxford here, here at the UC Senior Staff Health Program that uh, is run out of community clinics as an alcohol for how it could work. Um, increase the need or increase the goal for a psychotherapist to be building through the program or some category dependent practices as part of kind of strengthening the overall workforce. Um, and there were some long term kind of goals of just more transparency and accountability, some more program monitoring and evaluation, um, as well as data management programs being uh, released. You know, with perceived need, there was also a lot of concerns and perceived threats. And, you know, so one of the biggest option points was what happens to private insurance or employer based insurance for this. So, um, again, there was uh, fear that um, you know, that whole industry could come crashing down. Um, you know, concerns about uh, you know, if funds were transferred to policies, could they be mismanaged or could they be cut over time? You know, what would the sustainability of the program be? Um, you know, one of the things that we tried to drive home was that um, yes, this is important to address the cost barrier, but there's still many other barriers that um, this doesn't account for. So, you know, by giving every Canadian access to the insurance doesn't mean that they're going to have access to care. So we want to make sure that that was clear and addressed. And then uh, the long term sustainability. Interestingly, there was also a concern from academic institutions. So for all the oral kind of preventable education students, that's what yeah, what would happen to the um, standard function flow with yeah, most dental schools and dental schools are based on um, getting patients at discounted fees for not having insurance, but if they were able to go into private practice, would there be the same volume of patients for the training institutions? And so something that was brought up. But of course, you know, there's conflicting information or conflicting um, wishes from all the groups. Um, so no one would be on this mechanism. But at the same time, all we really knew uh, were just the scan details on. You know, this was the blueprint of what had to be included. Uh, no more the time. So, what the, the federal government in the early stages, so April and April, they were really only looking at two options at the time, because they, they seemed to be the easiest ones to, to go for in the timeline. Um, so, one was transferring funds to support the state program. So, part of um, you know, similar transfer agreement that we had in healthcare, and they would divest funds to each province. The provinces would use that as part of their kind of existing network of programs. Um, the other was to develop a standalone kind of administered program. So, you know, not exactly like the NHIB, but similar to that, they would administer uh, a program in that way. Each comes with its own kind of concerns and caveats. But, um, those were the kind of first two uh, things that they were looking at. In terms of transferring funds to existing provincial programs, um, Right from the early get go, um, they, they started to see the challenge with that approach. And you know, this was part of the document we, we sent to them. But if you look province by province, uh, you're, you're looking at over 60 different uh, public programs. So, you know, to transfer funds to support provincial programs, the first question is which program we support. Um, you know, no one program in the province meets the criteria that the MPP had set out. Um, so you would need for the first, you know, separate agreements with each province, um, which the federal government generally does not need to do any issue. Um, but then you need each province to um, come up with a mechanism for the target population that's covered by multiple different programs to be housed under one program. So there was no way that was going to happen with a you know, timeline, um, let alone maybe even a five-year timeline. Um, just what the complexity involved. So, so very early on, they realized that was probably not the way that, that, that they were going to need to go, um, even though it was probably the traditional preference just to um, to transfer the money and, and not be involved in the industry. Um, second challenge they really ran into was you know, if they were going to develop the program, you know, they had now gone up to June, July, and with all the consultations. So they lost about three months. And um, how they actually develop the program on December 1st. And so, you know, in July, they were already starting to look for extensions uh, from the NDP that uh, you know, can we pay till 2023. Um, and I think that was a fear amongst many of us in the oral healthcare community that, you know, would this be delayed and um, go any further? And, you know, we have to watch the agent coming in. 
scrapped. Um, the, the other constraint, um, you know, for better or for worse, was the, the NDP really did over the summer strengthen their position. So they made very clear what they were looking for in terms of uh, what was going to be this part of this agreement. And so they weren't going to budge on the minimum criteria the population was covered. They were definitely not going to budge um, for the deadline on December 1st. And so they made that clear in July. To, and um, that was not negotiable. And then they, they, they added that in July and August all their topic notes that it has to be a federally administered program. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of posturing. Um, I know by um, you know, some of the national provincial medical associations that you know, they need to address the reimbursement rates and that provincial programs or starting a um, federal program. Um, but then he had quashed that and uh, basically said, no, this has to be a federally administered program. And so again, time was kind of moving forward. And you know, that led us to September um, for the interim plan. So what we currently have is the Canada Defense with that. So this is planned to be launched in December 1st. Um, with retroactive coverage um, up until October uh, 2022. Uh, I think they're at the stage the legislation was passed through the House of Commons in you know, the next week or two, it should go before the, the Senate would expect it to pass. And so we will be taking applications for that. So this targets again get the first population of children the 12 direct payments to individuals and applications will be through the CRA, very similar to how we had the CDE and during the pandemic was set up. That you know, in no means is it a perfect plan, but it satisfied the criteria that had to be laid out and including the deadline. So it is interim. Now, this is not necessarily the final program. So what it looked like, that's what we have happening for the next year. In terms of the, the details, so again, it is kind of a stage that I'm approach um, based on income level. So $650 for families uh, with an adjusted net income under 70,000. And so th this is part of why they want to go through the CRAs because they can link it to the concert parents for that income verification. Um, but then it's kind of complementary decrease based on your income. You know, from at least the details released so far, uh, more should come out once it's passed by the Senate. Um, but they are, um, it, it seems to be a simple checklist, um, you know, that uh, families will have to attest to. And um, so when that's the child doesn't have private insurance, uh, that they will have out of pocket expenses for which they will use the benefits. So they have to somehow prove that. The funds are going to be used for um, dental care. How they will look to it, but I still don't know. It's being added, so we stayed there. And, and while they're not requiring seats, they're asking for people to keep it. Um, so I guess that's kind of the thread of an audit down the road yeah, when they file the tax return. So at least there is some of this in place. But um, yeah, I think when this was rolled out, there's a lot of uh, concern about how the funds could be used. Sorry to interrupt. Is the um money only for dental care or is it also for expenses surrounding that like travel and yeah so the, from my understanding of it it could incorporate travel but right now this is pretty much what that they, they just call it out of pocket expenses uh, I, I think the intent is for the dental care but i would that it could include um, a travel um, so private insurance you know, if you have it you will be able to access it um, but they have an aspirating record of showing private insurance, but they, they don't really specify what it means if you have public insurance or a public program. I think the intent is if you do have access to a publicly funded program, this can still be accessed for any expense of that income above or beyond that. So for travel down um, for some provinces, the general and STG fields would not be covered. Yeah, through this program, the estimated reach would be 500 million Canadians. It will cost to get close to 1 million, so a little lower than their kind of initial estimate, but that's just because the value of it is now capped at $650. So that's kind of where we are. I have some of the details on today, and, and I feel like I've changed this presentation on a weekly basis over the past few months because the key details are very much, but it's at least where we are at this moment of time. Um, and unfortunately, it kind of gives us more questions than answers. And so I'll go through at least the philosophy in my mind to kind of go forward. 
So the first is the obvious, you know, what does $650 for my dental care nowadays? So the first point is just understanding how they came up with this number because it wasn't full of that. Um, so you know, there are several reports out there that have been looking at public program expenditures. And the average tends to be for individual and public program and adults. Um, some are between five hundred and seven hundred dollars. Um, so if you look at say in Ontario, it would be the Healthy Smiles program. Um, across the whole program, um, they divide total expenditure by the number of people in the program. Each individual uses about um, five hundred to seven hundred dollars. So we can make that in the middle ground there. And that's based on public fees, so public university rates. Um, when you use $650 on a private system, it's not going to show up. Maybe two exam visits, just like the bill for a child. Um, so, not going to go a lot, but again, the idea is that this is what makes me a one time kind of benefit for the year. But we are concerned that there's a tendency once a policy is in place that that becomes a new policy. So, what really does happen you know, here from now, not a lot of those. How this coexists with existing public programs and what happens to existing public programs. So I think that's a concern. That, you know, how will the provinces respond? Well, if there is a federal program, do they need to continue funding emergency programs or will we see um, you know, decreased cuts over time when we've seen historically? So that's definitely something that has to be watched closely. Um, what's going to happen to employment employment based insurance? So similar incentive. If, if there's some kind of federal safety net, um, you know, will employers continue to offer types of things for their employees? That doesn't matter. Um, and I know the dental associations are you know, concerned concern about that because again, that does um, impact the business side of the industry better, of course. Um, that's something that they are looking at. You know, we're still concerned about, you know, this really doesn't address the access to care um, for many. Uh, population. So you know, even though this can be a program for any uh, individual with disabilities, the infrastructure uh, isn't there to, to really treat you with the expertise. Uh, there needs to be um, you know, a different approach than just a insurance plan. And likewise, if you're not a less successful area and there are no providers there, how is this going to work really help you? So really looking at that equity aspect of it. And then we're continuing to kind of focus on the public delivery aspect. And then really the overarching concern for kind of any other program is what happens with the next change of government. And um, so you know, this is a you know, agreement, um, but a temporary thing. We'll say for the next few years, but um, if the different parties in charge, what happens to the sustainability, particularly if there are delays to getting this program. Sorry, I can wait to the end, but my thought. Um, as of today, what has that been the I have the term. So they have to turn, so they don't know if it's the NIC. Not yet. Plan. So at least from discussions we have. So yeah, they, they're focused on the rollout of uh, the six hundred fifty dollars first, but they're also in the background of planning for what a program will look like. That the NIC is probably what they're going to look at. They don't want to create um, yeah. differences. Yeah. So all the federal programs. So there are a few for the. Refugees and asylum just in the area. And the correctional institutions that the federal government is running, they're all similar to the NHG in terms of what they're costing. So I wouldn't expect it to be less than that. But again, that's, that's speculation at this point. Yeah, they're going to retro pay them. <laughs> yep. More questions than answers. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, at least from our perspective, I uh, uh, this from the CHG. You know, we know that there's not going to be any one program that's going to be perfect. Um, so something's better than nothing, but there's also going to be gaps that need to be filled. And um, this was a paper in uh, the conversation by two of our class presidents, uh, Sonic and Signal, and most of them were this. And, and it really laid out that what should be fundamentals for any public program, hoping to you know, increase discussion along this area and some advice for the federal government to like it really needs to be a definition of a core basket of services that has to be updated based on evidence. So you look at the example of impacts versus dentures you know, in terms of the quality of life, very few public programs you know, covering plans. Um, but maybe um, you know, there's evidence that it should be the standard of care going forward. 
like my spirit few programs cover comprehensive prevention and we all know the purpose of that. So you know, really identifying what should be included, what services are there going forward. Um, based on principles of fair remuneration, a mix of public and private administration. So what I mean by that is you know the federal uh, government or an provincial government could own the program. People that could also you know, hire a third party uh, firm to manage the claims because um, it becomes a resource intensive for them to actually monitor that process. Um, definitely a mix of public and private delivery and the seated affordability and accessibility and that and other regions. And so this tends to be the focus of uh, you know, what we plan to do going forward. You know, whatever the details of the plan are going to be, you know, we realize that there will be some gaps. And you know, it is part of our really our goal uh, as well as healthcare professionals. We want to identify those gaps and make sure that people not covered by the circles who still find a way forward. So the work doesn't end um, once we have the actual program details. And then again, it's you know the cost aspect will be addressed for some Canadians, but um, it, it barely scratches the surface when we look at access to care from a holistic approach. So we really need to look out for those and communities who have access to this plan. Make sure they're not forgotten that you know, this is not just the one time to check that the other is cash and that it will solve the problem. So with that, I will end that my talk. I, uh, email us there or you can just through the CPHD. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions now or in the future. You know, as more details come out eventually over time, um, they are more than available as a resource. Uh, we'll probably have the same questions at the time, but I'm um, just happy to talk about um, you know, politics of us, what it means to us in as a public health. So, again, anyway, I thank the organizers for inviting me here today um, in person, which is always great. And thank you all for. Thank you.